بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله Brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته I thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for giving us the opportunity to speak about his religion, about his deen. I thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for gathering us today in order for us to remember him. And I pray this is a gathering in which it is blessed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because without the barakah of Allah, without the blessings of Allah, we don't really have anything. And as I always say, that the barakah of Allah transcends physics or mathematics because barakah is one plus one is equal to three. You put two natural things together and there's an added element that's from Allah that actually extends it and gives it that divine blessing. So I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that today's gathering has barakah. The topic of today is going to be about the aspect of the sermon of our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he spoke to the people listening to him and he said those who are not aware those who are not present convey to them convey to them the message of Islam and they may understand it better than the people who are currently listening and this concept, this idea, this theme concerns the da'wah which is calling people to the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as Allah says in the Quran ila sabili rabbik call to the way to the path to the sabil of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this topic brothers and sisters is a phenomenal topic and sometimes it's addressed in a very cliched fashion but I want to try and address it in a way that really penetrates your heart and soul and the first thing I want to say, brothers and sisters, is that the concept of da'wah is a self-defining concept. The concept of calling people to the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to tawheed, to affirming the oneness of Allah, that there is no deity worthy of worship but Allah. This is a self-defining concept. And that if you don't engage in the da'wah, you lack a sense of self. It's as if you remove some of your personality, some of your identity, some of your nature away from yourself. You become an incomplete human being, an incomplete Muslim. Because think about it, brothers and sisters. Think about the month of Ramadan. Think about this blessed month in which in the last week, in the last 10 days, in the last nights of the last 10 days, we are beseeching Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are crying and we are begging. And we're saying, Ya Allah, forgive me. Ya Allah, elevate my Iman. Ya Allah, make me of the people who are close to you. Make me of the people that you love. And make me love you more than anything else. Ya Allah, help me elevate myself in order to come close to you. Help me be deserved of that maqam, of that status. We have all been there in the last few nights of the month of Ramadan. Begging Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in sajda when we know according to the words of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that in sajda we are closest to Allah so supplicate, talk, have a divine discourse with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we all begged and cried. And we all want to elevate ourselves from a Muslim to a mu'min. From a Muslim to a mu'min to elevate our sense of self, a sense of spirituality, our Iman. However, there is a condition to this. And this condition can be found in the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this hadith is found in the famous compilation of Al-Nawawi in his Arba'in, in his 40 hadith. It's the 13th hadith where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, you won't truly believe unless you love for your brother what you love for yourself. Now let's analyze this properly. Let's analyze the words of the Prophet ﷺ. He is saying to us, we won't elevate our iman. We won't find true faith, true belief, true iman 
unless we love for your brother what you love for yourself. Now this brotherhood does not mean Muslim brotherhood. This brotherhood, yes, means Muslim brotherhood, but also it means in general human brotherhood. We have the student of Ibn Qayyim, Ibn, Ibn Qayyim al Jawziyah, his name was Imam Rajab al Hanbali. He wrote the book, The Compendium of Wisdom and of Knowledge. And he analyzed this hadith. And then he said, This hadith means people, means insaniya, means humanity. Because the defining feature of the Sunnah of the Prophet, his legacy was that he wanted to give the thing that he loved to others, whether that person was Muslim or non Muslim. And that thing that he loved was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, was the deen of Islam. And therefore he is telling us that if we truly love Allah, and we truly love the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which should be things that we love the most, more than ourselves and more than our own mothers. If we truly love the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and we truly love Allah, then to define ourselves as believers, as having true belief, perfected faith, we have to give this love to human beings. Therefore, this should create within us a sense of self-image psychology. If I want to elevate my Iman, then the only way to achieve that, or one of the ways to achieve that, is to give that love to others. So how do you give the love of Allah and the love of the Prophet وسلم, to other people? What do you have to do? Give them? Da'wah, exactly. And this shows us that Da'wah is a self-image thing. It's a sense of self. It becomes part of your spiritual DNA. Because if you look in the mirror and you see someone who wants to elevate their Iman from a Muslim to a Mu'min, if when you make dua to Allah and when you have a whole spiritual program in your life to come closer to Allah, to reach that level, the only way you completely reach that level if you start to walk in the footsteps of the Prophet وسلم, and give the thing that you love the most to other people. And we all know we love Allah the most. We all know we love the Prophet وسلم. Therefore, it's time we gave that love to other people. We have no choice, brothers and sisters. It's a self-image psychology thing. And that's why I want all of you in this room, before you walk out of this room to understand, in order for me to have an elevated sense of self, an elevated degree of spirituality, I have to engage in the da'wah. And this is very important because I would even argue that if you're not walking on a path of da'wah, brothers and sisters, you will never understand the Qur'an properly. Never! Because many of the stories of the Prophets are not stories of afkar, are not stories of beard, are not stories of hijab, are not stories of clothes, are not stories of X, Y, and Z or X, Y, and Z. <laughs> but rather, these stories, brothers and sisters, are stories of da'wah. The stories of the Prophets are the stories of the call to the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you're not walking in that path, how is the Qur'an going to connect with you? How are you going to connect with the Qur'an properly? So for you to come close to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you have to walk in the footsteps of the book if you like. Tread the path of the stories of the Prophets in order to understand and internalize the profound lessons of Yusuf alayhi salam or the profound lessons of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam or the profound lessons of Nuh alayhi salam or the profound lessons of Adam alayhi salam or the profound lessons of Dawood alayhi salam or the profound lessons of Ibrahim alayhi salam we won't really resonate with them unless we are walking the walk we are starting to give da'wah so there's two things we discussed so far number one da'wah is a self-image psychology thing if you don't give da'wah you don't elevate your sense of self, your sense of Iman because of the hadith we mentioned. The second point is, you will never connect with the Book of Allah properly. Because you're not walking in the path in which the Qur'an sheds light on. And in a way, not giving da'wah and reading the Qur'an is like walking in darkness. If you want the Qur'an to light your life, then walk the path of the Prophet which is a path of da'wah. 
The other point we have to realize, brothers and sisters, is that actually, Dawah gives us life. It gives us true life, because many of us, we're Muslim robots. Honestly, we're like biological machines. We just obey our core instincts of survival and procreation. We're no different to cattle. Bel, Allah says Bel, rather, nay, they are worse than cattle. And some of us, unfortunately, were like this. We're in the middle class, upper middle classes of America. We have it easy. We have our big houses, our big cars, right? We have our big families sometimes, too much pizza and food and junk. And we think we've made it. But actually, your whole life reduces itself to survival and reproduction. And I don't care if you bought her a big diamond ring. I don't care if you wrote her poetry. I don't care how big your house is. I don't care if you have a PhD. All of that reduces itself to survival and reproduction. No different from the cows grazing in the land and chewing on the grass and making babies. That's what they do and that's what you do. You're no different from an animal. But what we have to do, brothers and sisters, is actually give us lives, true life. As Allah says in the Quran, Ya ayyuhalladina amanu, O you who have believed, istajibu lillahi wa li rasuli, ila da'akum lima yuhyikum. O you who have believed, respond to the call of Allah and His Messenger to that which gives you life. The ulama said if you don't respond to this call, and this call, According to Imam Bukhari is the call of all good. And according to Ibn Kathir, all of good is the whole of Islam comprehensively. So if you don't respond to this call, you're dead Muslim walking. Dead Muslim walking. And this should create another sense of psychology, a sense of self, that we have to call people to the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another key reason, brothers and sisters, why we have to give down, because it changes the world. We all chase the political and social mirage in the social political landscape. We go for liberalism, neoliberalism, conservatism, neoconservatism, socialism, communism, capitalism, all of the ism and schisms we've tried and they failed. And we think it's a solution. We found the water in the desert, but when we come close, it's just a mirage and we quench our spiritual, social, political thirst with dry sand. And we don't realize that the only solution is in the Dawah itself, brothers and sisters. Because the Dawah changes the world. Because if you truly believe in Allah, you truly believe in the Prophet wasallam. you believe in these values, are the basis for coherent, tolerant, compassionate, loving, just society, then why are you chasing a mirage? Why are you infected with the wholesome and inferiority complexes? with this kind of post-colonial complex. Why? What's wrong with you people? What's wrong with us? Is this the deen of haq or not? Why do we have this intellectual gymnastics to couch our narratives in false discourse? A discourse that cannot be linked to the values of Islam. It's time we articulate a warm, compassionate, loving case for Islam to the wider society. And to be honest with people, yes, we're different. But there's humanity in this different. Yes, we look different, but there's relevance in this difference. Yes, we're different, but in this strangeness there is love. In this strangeness there is compassion. In this strangeness there is a new world view that will change society for the better. And the Dawah did exactly that, brothers and sisters. 80 years after the death of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which was the biggest calamity for the Ummah, the death of our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Just 80 years, we were in Multan in Pakistan, and we were in Spain, calling people to the oneness, mercy, compassion, and love of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And it was 82 years after his death, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that the Muslims decided to fix the mosque of our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because it was still dripping of water. This goes to show that the early Muslims understood that buildings, pestle and mortar and concrete didn't mean anything at all. That what meant something was the pillars in your heart that were fixated 
to the belief in Allah and to the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That we had to create people of substance, not buildings of substance. But now we have building of substance, but not people of substance. And that's the major problem. Look in your societies in America, you have huge masajid, huge masajid, hundreds of them around the United States. What changes have we made on a huge level? We're still seen as the boogeyman, as the new communists, as the backward folk. We still have Fox News being representatives of our deen. They are the du'at, Fox News. Shame on us. They are the du'at. They are calling to what they think Islam is. But where are we? We're too busy making the money. We're too busy buying the funky hijabs. We're too busy designing the funky beards, right? We're too busy with these things. It's kind of self-image, this kind of apologetic narrative. Qum fa'andir, arise and warn with rahmah, with compassion. Because Dawah changed the world, brothers and sisters. Dawah changed the world. Because when we went to Islamic Spain, we took over the Iberian Peninsula. When we took over the Iberian Peninsula, what did we do? We created this convivencia, which means a coexistence. A coexistence of Muslims, of Jews and Christians that live together in harmony, in tranquility, with the founder of capitalism, the 18th century founder, Adam Smith, in one of his essays said, it was the first state that had that needed tranquility in order for human beings to look into the interconnecting principles of nature. It is no wonder the artistic French critic, Jean-Jacques Levesque, he said, don't think the Muslims cross the world because they like the test, the taste of infidel blood. No, they cross the world because they were encouraged by the Quran to go to the horizons because there will be truth in the horizons of Allah says in the Quran. And in the horizons, we will show you our signs and in yourselves until you know this is the haqq. You know that this is the truth. This was the reality of the Muslims spreading peace and justice to the point where an academic Jew, Zion Zohar, in his book on Sephardic Jewry, he said thus, when the Muslims crossed the Straits of Gibraltar in the Iberian Peninsula, the Jews saw the Muslims as liberators from Christian persecution. A.S. Tritton, in his academic study on Umar and the non-Muslim subjects, he said that the Christians preferred Muslim rule to that of the Franks. This was our reality. This was our reality, brothers and sisters, creating peace and justice and harmony for everybody. And this is not a historical accident because these principles belong in our value system, belong in our ethical system. When we know the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever harms a dhimmi, a non-Muslim under our protection, it's as if he harmed the Prophet himself. Allahu Akbar. Allah says in the Quran three times, Inna Allah yuhibbul muqsiteen. Indeed, Allah loves the just. Justice, compassion, rahmah, mercy, tolerance is, about our, is, is our tradition. That's why people flock towards Islam. They never run away from Islam. People came to Islam. Look, Philip Mansell's book, he's an academic historian. In his book, Constantinople, he has a primary source, a letter from a Jew in 1453 when they were persecuted in Spain. This Jew, he was a rabbi. He went to the land of the Turks, the Uthmani Khilaf of the Ottoman period. And he writes, all my brethren, all my brothers, come to the land of the Turks. Rich are the fruits of the earth. We're not oppressed with heavy taxes and we live in peace and freedom. Allahu Akbar. It is no wonder the editor of the New York Times he said, if the Muslims took over Europe, we would have six million more Jews today. This is the reality of Islam. It changed people. It changed hearts. It changed minds. And the Dawah can do that. If you call people to these values, people will use these values. Take for instance, and I'll end on this, the value of just distribution in economics. Brothers and sisters, Muslims are not the biggest terrorists in the world. Actually, I have a theory. You want to hear my theory? Yes. I believe Muslims are the most peaceful people on this planet. Uqsum Billah. By Allah. We are the most peaceful people on this planet. Because turn the tables. 
Imagine in the Western Europe society, the white Western Europeans, what was happening to the Muslims is happening to them. Imagine there was 30 years of ideological warfare trying to deconstruct the religious tradition, killing Muslims and making their blood being cheaper than water. Imagine there was 1.2 million non-Muslims, say the French, 1.2 million French died just because of the so-called war on terror. Imagine there was a half a million children starved to death or died because of sanctions, unjust sanctions. Imagine this happened to European West. You tell me if there will be a planet Earth left. This amazing nation is based on terrorism. 26 million people died, American Indians, so you could have your food, shelter and clothing. When the Japanese, they had the kamikaze pilots and they went to Pearl Harbor, which by the way, wasn't a residential area, it was Marines, it was an act of war. What did this nation do? It killed 250,000 innocent Japanese people. And you're telling me about Muslims are violent. SubhanAllah, if you were to turn the tables, there will be no humanity left. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. But my point is, brothers and sisters, my point is, take the values of just distribution. One of the greatest forms of terrorism, in my opinion, is greedy, unabated capitalism. We have selective outrage. We always have to apologize for five deaths here, two deaths here, as if we're to blame. We're peaceful people. We can't take the blame for some crazy people. We're peaceful people. We are peaceful people. Allah is salam the source of peace, and we manifest His names and attributes. And we have to remember that unabated capitalism has killed every year 8 million innocent human beings because of starvation. 8 million, you don't even know these numbers. There is a statistic for you. According to UNICEF, 8 million human beings die because of starvation. The majority of them are children under 5 years old. But we live in a world where we have enough resources to, f to feed them. Take for example the Food Agriculture Organization. It states that we have enough calories on this planet to feed everybody 2,700 calories. That's enough for everybody. If you include children and women and people who don't need that many calories, that's around two planets. We have enough food on this planet to feed two planets. So the problem is not resources. The problem is distribution. Capitalism says, too many needs, my friend, not enough resources. You have to step on his back to succeed. You have to stab him in the heart to succeed. But Islam says, Allah is our razak, he is the provider. We have enough resources. We have to use our values to distribute them fairly for everybody, Muslim and non-Muslim. This is the deen, this is the values. In Chicago, just an hour and a half, plane ride away from here, in downtown Chicago, people only go to school, brothers and sisters, so they can have the only meal of the day. This is the United States of America, the home of the brave, the land of the free. But when you have Islamic values, everybody is fed, because it's based on principles from the Quran and the prophetic traditions that spoke about just distribution. This is why Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, one of the leaders of Islam, he said, oh people, Put wheat on the top of the mountains so the people don't say we kept the birds hungry. The birds, people. This is our tradition, brothers and sisters, to feed everybody black, white, yellow, green, blue, female, male, and those in between. <laughs> because frankly, some of our males are a bit between these days, right? We need to man up. That's one of the problems the sisters are having because the men are not real men. We've been mothered too much. Oh, I hurt myself. Oh, I have man flu. I'm not going to work today. Oh, look what he said about me. Frankly, we become the in-betweeners. <laughs> so brothers and sisters, see how the values change the world? The values, our values can do that. So don't be ashamed of them. It doesn't mean you're an extremist. It doesn't mean you're a terrorist. You love this country. I'm not born here. I love this country. I used to work for an American company. I used to go to Virginia. I was lost. And someone was so kind, he said, jump in my car and he drove me to work 15 minutes out of his time. That's never happened to me in my country in Britain. American people are nice people. American people are 
compassionate people. It's a Christian nation. They have these values. Don't be afraid. They're waiting for you to speak to them because they're lost. There's a spiritual vacuum, this social vacuum. Islam can fill it. You have the solution. Don't stay stum because you're scared. And I end with the words of the Prophet ﷺ when he said, Speaking the haq does not take away your provisions and does not bring your death closer. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.